the research on this. I see. Yes, there is that aspect, and I don't have a problem with that. But there's also a misguided, and I'm sure that Buddhists have very misguided views. Uh, definitely, I just don't, didn't mention it here because this is such an extreme example. Um, but yeah. I'm talking about those misperceptions. I mean, there are also Buddhists who believe if they stop eating. I mean, the Buddha himself, he stopped eating. That was silly. Honestly, it was silly. Stopped eating, like ascetic practices. Okay? So the Buddha taught us, don't make my mistake. Right? I mean, I'm saying silly, but like, uh, basically, that was wrong. This is an extreme practice. Asceticism is extreme. Right? And so Buddha himself, through his example, he's gone to one extreme, two extremes. Overindulgence, enjoying the good life, and just only enjoying, not thinking of anything else. And then going to the extreme of mortifying his body. Both are wrong. Both are extremes. And the second one, mortifying his own body, like this ascetic practice, was seen as a spiritual practice. It didn't take him anywhere. He almost drowned. Okay. So, similarly, in some religious traditions one finds the practice of ritual animal sacrifices. Mm -hmm. oh, in Nepal, it's terrible. In Nepal, they have this tradition of killing animals on a specific days. Yeah, it's terrible. They kill all these animals. You saw that. But when the plane leaves, apparently, they cut off the chicken, a head of a chicken on the, on the, on the, at, the, at the plane and they put the sprinkle the blood on the plane. It's like bizarre. And the, if a family is really poor, they take an egg. <laughs> <laughs> but they actually kill goats and there's like goats, goats and bulls, etc. I've never seen it, but they say there's blood running down the streets of Kathmandu. Mm -hmm. It's terrifying. Why would you kill another animal? What is the religious aspect of it? So this is also quite dangerous. In Judaism, yeah. 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 In Judaism, yeah. 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 the chicken. Yeah. You see that as a religious practice? That's considered yeah. Yeah. torture. Yeah. 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 It's ending yeah. now? These kids, yeah. yeah. these yeah. 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 chicken yeah. will yeah. die and I will be in heaven. No, I mean, I will go to the good life next time. This. Hmm. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, I <laughs> don't want to offend anyone, but I'm um, not sure this, uh, how that can be spiritual, how you taking the life of another living. Yeah. But, yeah. 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 Well, it depends. Yeah, maybe it's, I mean, if there's some higher meaning behind that and actually explains that, I don't know. I don't want to be like I'm saying. I'm, no, no, no. I, yeah. I think it's like the the basic idea is that something can take you of sins. You know, I think it's really common. Uh, it was very common. Okay, that could also be the case, but from a Buddhist point of view, unfortunately, no. I I made the mess. I'll experience it. So from a Buddhist point of view, no, that would definitely uh, not be considered just that particular aspect would be considered to believe in the supremacy of a mistaken ethic or religious conduct. Then there are various ascetic practices such as standing on one leg or burning the body in the sun for a long time in order to purify negativities. Just mean Buddhism has also existed. Those practices have also existed. Maybe exist even now. I mean, there, there are some Buddhist families who do that, animal sacrifice. Not a good idea. <laughs> Further, there are numerous cases of self-immolation and ritual suicide that are performed for the sake of spiritual salvation. The view that holds such practices as supreme and as a means of attaining spiritual emancipation is the fourth of the five views. So, like I said, they're just different and wrong view then refers to all the wrong views. It's just a different way of looking at them. So those are, those are the, the main kind of negative or afflictive minds that actually harm ourselves. That, Short term or long term, they harm us. And then there's so many other different versions of them, and I just quickly go through them, and then we're basically done, or we have time for some meditation. Do you know the uh, uh, view of Holiness on self emulations of Buddhists? Like the view on self emulations by His Holiness? Yeah. Don't do it. I mean, the, you know the Tibetans burning themselves for Tibet's freedom? Oh, terrible. For a while, I was like, Every week there was someone who, who put the, set themselves on fire. Did it help? No. Not at all. It was terrible. It was terrible. Every time you heard, like this prayer, you knew someone had self-immolated themselves. It was terrible. Um, 
So no, his holiness says, I mean, if his holiness was in a very difficult situation because on one hand, there were these people that thought it was going to help the cause, the Tibetan cause, so they sacrificed their life. And then if his holiness is saying that was wrong, that kind of adds, you know, on top of it, some survived. And then his holiness telling them, so his holiness was very careful. But he kept saying, Don't, why, you have a precious life. You, you look, if someone putting themselves on fire, if, had, if it had miraculously somehow solved the problem, mm -hmm. by all means, right. right? Okay, if one person, but it didn't have any positive effect. No one even knew about it. The, 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 the Chinese said that Tibet is, they're depressed, they have some mental problems. So in China or in Tibet, people believed, influenced by the media, that those were just mentally disabled people. And in the West, no one even knew about it. Okay, So to give your life for a just cause, that's one thing. Right? That's a huge self-sacrifice, but it should also be done with wisdom. So if you save another person's life, right? Like for instance, I don't know. Um, in the army. Like in the army. I've heard this, like there was an army officer and someone pulled the, the, huh. the little thing. I don't even know. <laughs> talking to you guys. Don't you know what it's called? You know, it's like this thing and you pull it. It's 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 yeah, that one. perfect. I don't know. You're doing I've seen it in the movies. And then you have to hold it, right? And he kind of threw it, and, uh, and the people around this, I mean, he kind of, I don't know what happened, dropped it, and this army officer threw himself on it to save everyone's life. Wow. A lot of people do that? No, no, no. But it happens. There are cases that they aren't here. <laughs> I mean that is that is that that I think that is not a mistake. That is that is pure altruism, yes. right? I mean people saving other people's life without any consideration. I have the greatest admiration for those people. No matter army, not army, wherever you are, if people do that. That is so beautiful. That self-sacrifice. Anyway, so that I'm not talking about. But just okay, freedom for Tibet. Put yourself on fire, and and it doesn't work. No. I think it's a good idea. So his holiness has expressed that sentiment, and fortunately, it stopped. It stopped now. I don't. I haven't heard of any self-immolation recently. Okay. All right. And then let's just go through some of the few ones here. Just aggression or belligerence. Um, so here, the the next, the twenty-second are afflictions. They are just slightly different versions from the ones before. So I won't say much about them. Aggression. So this is an increase of the primary affliction of anger. So instead of just having anger, you, you take it further. Aggression is a, a, a stronger form of anger where you wish to physically harm or verbally harm someone. Okay. And there's resentment. The resentment is a mental factor that maintains the continuum of the primary affliction of anger. So initially you were angry, but then you hold on to this resentment as in like without forgetting it, and you want to retaliate, <coughs> right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's also see the, the, the different forms of anger, and why are they all mentioned? Which one do I have? Just to be able to recognize them. It's almost like when you go through a catalog of diseases and symptoms. <laughs> right? And like, which one is my problem? Which one is my issue? Which one do I have to pay attention to? Oh. Oh. Yeah. But at different times, etc. So first here it gives you the ability to recognize and then recognize in our own mind. Concealment. Wanting to conceal our faults from others out of ignorance, out of misperception of reality, when they're pointed out by someone with the motivation to benefit. Right? Ah, oh, it's difficult. It's very difficult if someone points out our, 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 what, our faults and to say, yes, you're right. Right? Initially, you're like, nah, no. Right? We're trying to hide it. It's, it's very interesting how the mind works. So if we know there is that, there is that denial, that concealment, then maybe if someone criticizes us, we can take it constructively and, and take a moment and listen and go, well, maybe you're right. Interesting. Okay? But criticism is a very difficult one. Being criticized is one thing. right? We can take that positively. Even if it comes out of anger, actually can be helpful. right? But criticizing someone else, that's a very interesting one. Should I criticize another person? 
or not? This question was once asked, Kishtutta Pesamala was asked this question. And he didn't say, don't do it. No, sometimes it's necessary. But it depends how we do it. That's the most important part. The problem is, when we criticize someone, we're used to doing this out of anger. Right? When we're angry, we criticize someone. We start going, oh, no, 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 but what you did is wrong. Like, think of your relationship with another person. The people we're closest to, we can be the cruelest, we can be most cruel to them. We're more cruel to the people very close to us than to the bus driver. <laughs> right? We will never treat the bus driver the way we sometimes treat family members or partners, etc. So we are used to criticizing out of anger. If you can criticize another person without falling into the habit of anger, by all means, say so. Do something. I mean, you should do it. It's good to be. But as long as you really know you can control that. And what I always think is important is when you want to tell another person about a mistake, also point out a quality they have. Because oftentimes, if we only point out the mistake, the other person feels misunderstood. It's like they have not only negative qualities, they also have positive qualities. And people are much more likely to be on the defensive when all they hear are negative qualities. So if you want to really tell someone about a negative quality, well, you could start off with telling them, telling them the things you appreciate about them. Kind of saying, look, you know, you've done this, it's really wonderful. One thing I notice, I don't know whether you want me to say it, otherwise I won't say anything. And then they usually go, what, what, what is it? <laughs> right? So it, it's, it's, it's a nice way to first make them feel understood. I mean, point out the positive qualities if they are, and they usually are. Okay, this is what I really appreciate. There's one thing I noticed, but it could just be me misunderstanding it. Right? So allowing the other person to say, yes, please let me hear. And if they don't want to hear it, okay, fair enough. You may even know what we're trying to tell them. But oftentimes, most people would then say, oh, okay, so let me know, what is it? And so, since you've already said something positive about the other person, they feel safe, they don't feel like you're just trying to criticize them, but you have more of a balanced view. And then you, it gives you the opportunity to talk to with them about it, and then they, they can respond, etc. And it just helps them to grow, and we, I would want to be told, right? First hearing it, it's not that nice, but in the long term, it's good to hear if there's room for improvement, because oftentimes we don't know. So anyway, being in denial about things can be a problem. So that is one, one of those uh, negative ones, or harmful ones. Spite is a mental factor that is a type of anger which motivated by, motivated by aggression and resentment wants to speak harshly, spite, like when you want to just really hurt the other person. It's the type of mind that wants to be spiteful. Okay. Jealousy, jealousy, 21st century problem. <laughs> it's a mental factor that is a type of anger which motivated by attachment to material possession status, etc., cannot bear and feels resentful towards others' accomplishments. It's the competitive society we are in. There's nothing wrong with that as such, but it has the disadvantage of triggering jealousy. Competitiveness as such is not that negative. If you, because another person does well, and you also want to do well because they do well, that's okay. But in this case, you're not unhappy about their success. You compare yourself and you think, hmm, they're doing really well, I want that too. Right, so you're kind of, motivated, inspired, if we use a positive word, to become like that. So if it's like, wow, I want to be like that, you're so wonderful, great, I want to be like that. That's beautiful. That's inspired. Competitiveness, that's being inspired. Competitiveness is like, it's not like you're inspired as such, you just think it's nice and you want to be like that. Okay? And then the negative version is you don't want them to be like that, you want yourself to be like that. So it's like from a positive state, being inspired, Competitive, negative, jealous, right? Or envious, envious. So there, there is a healthy degree. I usually say that every emotion, every negative emotion has a healthy counterpart. Every healthy, every, every emotion. Anger has a healthy counterpart. It is wrong to do this. This is unjust and we need to do something about it. That's okay. When you see an injustice, you may feel strongly about it. 
try to stop the other person so they don't harm themselves and they don't harm others. That is the sensible version of anger. But with anger, it's like exaggerating the negativity, wanting to harm this person, just adding, exaggerating. Attachment is the, 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 the counterpart, the positive one. This is something good. I want it because it's good for me and it's good for others. Just wanting it because it's positive. But then we exaggerate the positiveness. We feel like we can't live without it. And then it's attachment, it's craving. So you see, there is a counterpart. There are minds that are their partners, if you like. But the, the ones that are not exaggerated. Love, love and compassion. Right now, my, so self-grasping, the counterpart is love, right? I see my happiness is more important. My happiness is most important. No, love, self-love and love for others is, I want to be happy, I deserve to be happy, others want to be happy, they deserve to be happy, that's it. Self-centeredness is like that wish for someone to be happy. Now I need to be the one who's happy. There's no space for anyone else's happiness. So that's self-centeredness. You see? So it's, it's, we have that healthy version, but because of our misperception, it's exaggerated. All right, jealousy, miserliness, tightness, and tightness of heart. Don't want to give, miserliness. That's uh, page 60. Miserliness. How do you say miserliness? Kamtsanu. Miserliness, okay. <laughs> Pretension or deceit, de deceit. So when we pretend we possess qualities that we don't have, right? We like to pretend we have certain qualities. Sounds familiar? Yeah, no, familiar with that. Dissimulation. We don't How want to. How can we live with all this? Huh? How can we live being with all this? <laughs> well, then say there's eighty-four thousand of them. <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's, not meant to, it's not meant to depress us, maybe like a little bit depressing and we should go through the virtuous ones later because we always have those. No, it's just, those are the ones to recognize that... Just recognize your mind. Okay, anyway, so dissimulation, you don't want, I'm just going through it quickly. So, you do not want others to know your shortcomings, that's dissimulation. Haughtiness is like... Um, kind of arrogance here. So an afflictive sense of self-confidence. It's not just, not as strong as arrogance, but it's kind of similar in that we think like, I'm just a little bit better. It's a type of arrogance, but it's not as strong. Harmfulness, it's a type of anger that wants to inflict harm on others. Non-shame is, again, before when there was shame, like we don't want, out of self-respect, I'm not gonna do it. And having no self-respect and just wanting to do it because I don't care. I can do whatever I want kind of idea. Inconsideration or non-embarrassment is here without consideration for others to just go ahead and engage in negative actions. Dullness. It's a mental factor. It's a type of ignorance which makes the mind lethargic so that it's unable to comprehend its object clearly. So this kind of like allowing the mind just to be dull and to be lethargic. That's actually negative. Excitement. But excitement out of, out of attachment, not excitement, there's a positive excitement, oh, I'm really excited. But if it's out of attachment, uh, then it can become negative, a negative one. Non-faith, having no aspiration for anyone, not aspiring towards virtuous phenomena, that is non-faith. Laziness, okay, laziness, it's a negative one, but laziness is also procrastination and what is another type of laziness? Down. <laughs> to look down on yourself. Yeah. I can't do it. Laziness. We don't identify that as laziness, but this kind of like, I can't do anything. That's a yeah. negative state of mind. Very, very. Low, low yeah, only of meditation. Yeah, low self-esteem as in like self-deprecating. Oh, I can't do these things. I, that's a form of laziness. Yeah, because you said before that you, don't, you can do it, so you don't do it. It's laziness. Right, you, you can actually do it, but you choose yeah. to know, yeah, in a, in a way it's kind of like an excuse, no, I can't do this, I can't do this, because it, it requires hard work, it's not that easy, and so, yeah, but it can also be like, even go to the degree, like you really believe you're worthless. 
that is very that's that's very very dangerous this feeling of worthlessness it can actually take you to the point where you want to kill yourself very very dangerous so but it's a very negative state of mind because not like you're a bad person or anything that's not what it's saying but it's saying that it's so harming you so much and you need to find a way to get out of it and to because what what do we do when we have that self-deprecating attitude we exaggerate what do we exaggerate shortcomings so just as with anger towards another person we focus on only the negative qualities of that person we do not allow ourselves to look at our positive qualities but we have quite positive qualities it's impossible that we don't have them so it's very important to depending on if we have arrogance focus on the negative qualities and our mind is so tricky one moment we're arrogant next moment we're we're, we're self-deprecating that's what i'm saying we're like multiple possibilities in a sense but different types of awareness right and you develop the awareness you try to develop introspection to become aware of it and then develop the antidote appro appropriately so we are we have taught all these different mental factors because if you're really interested in develop the, developing the mind, the only way is to develop mindfulness first. And hopefully this has been encouraged a little bit during this course, so getting to know your, your mind better, and then make it a habit that whatever you do, when you have a little bit of space in the mind, while you're in a traffic jam, while you're brushing your teeth, while you do an action that doesn't require much attention, what is my mind doing? What am I thinking? When you're with another person, Right? You focus on what the other person thinks, but every now and then you look inwards. What is my motivation right now? Am I being arrogant? Am I being pride? Am I proud? Am I being haughty? Am I being humil am I humble? Am I loving? Am I angry? Right? To check. Because in the end, it harms us. These states of mind harm us. They make us act in a certain way, which is inappropriate in the moment, may destroy our relationship with the other person and bring us a lot of unhappiness. So just to be happy, forget about liberation and enlightenment. I do mention them, because they're very much part of Buddhism. But you leave out that part. If you don't find it helpful, you know, in Tibetan you say, fold your ears. <laughs> right, in that moment, just ignore that part and take the bits in terms of like your everyday life, what you find helpful, okay? So, Really, the, the, real, the, the only way to really be happy is to start off with this. Look at your own mind. What am I doing? And in a very relaxed fashion, you start applying the antidotes. If there's arrogance, well, very easy. Maybe not in that moment. You can't kind of go, wait a minute, can you just sit down for a moment? I need to think of something. <laughs> that would be bizarre. But later on, when you're done with the conversation, you go, okay, what was that? There was this moment of arrogance. All right, what was I arrogant about? Kind of go back in time, recollect, like remember, and then think, well, okay, but actually there's no reason to be arrogant because I also have negative qualities. I'm good at that, but I'm not so good at that. So it levels the mind again, it takes it away from this extreme emotion, and then next time you're less likely for that mind to rise again. If you're angry in that moment, ah, interesting. When you're on your own, go back and think, hmm, what was that anger? attachment etc so you start with the more pronounced minds and if you if it stresses you out don't do it it's not like always be there like oh, i have to be very mindful my life is very stressful no 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 it should be easy going right if you can remember you remember and slowly as you progress you make it a habit laziness okay non-conscientiousness is together with the three poisons that is attachment anger and ignorance and with laziness leaves the mind in a relaxed state without habituating it to virtue and protecting it from contaminated phenomena it's being too relaxed out of a misperception being too chilled out okay it's good to be chilled out but there's an extreme version of that forgetfulness okay forgetfulness but not because you have a problem remembering. No, no. Forgetfulness because too much attachment, too what much is anger. Not consciousness? Pardon? What is not consciousness? What comes together with the one of the three poisons? And, and as it, the mental factor that to, with one of the three poisons, so anger, together with, yeah, together with and with laziness, right, leaves the mind in a relaxed state it without laziness. without habituating it to virtue. Forgetfulness is actually not forgetfulness in general. 
but because of other afflictions preoccupying you so much you cannot retain certain things any longer. Non-alertness, that is non-introspection, to not look inwards, to not be interested in looking inwardly, again out of um, afflictive wisdom, out of afflicted misperception, not a, being not alert with respect to physical, verbal and mental actions. So this is here, mindfulness and introspection. Those are the two that you need. Mindfulness in the sense of, actually there are three of them. Attentiveness, mindfulness and introspection. Introspection is the first one, turning inwards. Alertness is like being alert of what's going on, observing, being attentive to what's going on. And mindfulness is that which allows you to continue doing that. Yeah. So mindfulness actually in the Tibetan tradition is explained in terms of those three. Alert, introspection, alert, attentiveness, or introspection, attentiveness, and mindfulness. Okay? That's, uh, no, sorry. Um, introspection, alertness, and mindfulness. Yeah, attentiveness is the mindfulness. Mindfulness is this attentiveness, like keeping, to keep doing it, to keep your mind yourself what you're doing. So all this is usually described as mindfulness. It's like there's a blanket term, mindfulness, but it actually includes those three. Turning inwards, checking what's going on, checking and being alert. So not just turning inwards, but also being alert and keeping, keeping with the object, not forgetting the object. Okay? And of course, you need to let go of that when you're talking to another person. You can just do this for a few seconds, check, and go back to the conversation. Check and go back. And you can make that a habit that after a while, you will also always check your mind. You will just always be alert of what's going on. So you just gain more control of the mind. Can you say again the three? Uh, oh, um, introspection, introspection alertness, and mindfulness. If you read by His Holiness, His Holiness, there's a book, I'm not sure the, the same words are used, but it's beyond religion. If you read the book called Beyond Religion, yeah. 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 So the second part, <laughs> uh, the second part, not the first part, the second part of that gives a very beautiful explanation on many of these mental factors. Plus, it talks about those three. Shishi, Payo, Chamba. Those are the ones in Tibetan. So this is the translation I used. Introspection. I think it's alertness and mindfulness. Then uh, adds in his uh, teachings that uh, to add relaxation. Pardon? <coughs> Glenn, he adds relaxation. That's from, relaxation. Uh, from Alan Wallace into the meditation. Mm, relaxation. So he puts uh, introspection, mindfulness, and relaxation. We, we used to say that we have two tools, mm -hmm. mindfulness mm -hmm. or the introspection. So 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 brings you back to the object. Mm -hmm. Usually it's only two. Yes. Usually it's introspection yeah. and yeah. mindfulness, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, relaxation, maybe that's a 21st century no. yeah. addition. Because <laughs> we're so uptight, we need to also be relaxed about it. Yeah, yeah. 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 okay, so yeah, fair enough. Um, it's not traditionally mentioned, because like I said, Tibetans are pretty chilled out and pretty relaxed. No, it's for the Westerners. It's for the Westerners, yes. So, okay, relaxation. And then having that. Well, it perfectly makes sense. How? Because, yeah, sometimes those three things we need to do, and we want to do them perfectly. And then when we try to do them perfectly, we get really uptight, and then we don't want to do them anymore because it stresses us out. So then having relaxation, first feel relaxed, and then apply those three. That would actually make sense. So, yeah, adding relaxation, I think, is a good idea. Okay. Um, all right. Non non introspection. So distraction, out of anger, attachment, and so forth, being distracted. All right. That's it. And then one last one. And we do in meditation. Yeah. We have time. Yeah. Um, so the last ones. There are four changeable mental factors, which can be positive, negative, or neutral. Virtuous, non virtuous, or neutral. Sleep can be virtuous, non-virtuous, or neutral, depending on how you fall asleep. 
So therefore, it's considered to be important that before you sleep, if you generate a virtuous mind, it has an influence on your on your sleep. It makes it virtuous. Eventually, it will become neutral, but but 